All right, guys. It is another cold, frosty midwinter day here. I guess at least it's late November now. It is a. We have made it to Monday, November 21st, 2022. So guys, I was going to do a chronicle of the collapse about a dead whale. A dead sperm whale choking to death on a 300 pound gob of garbage. Which is as good of a chronicle of a collapse as any. Oh, Jesus. Uh, but anyway, that one's a little bit too depressing. So, uh, I want to thank uh, my fellow Collapsitarian. And I don't know if Raynard Loki uh, is a subscriber here or not. Raynard, are you, uh, are you part of this gang? But uh, anyway, whoever Raynard Loki is... Uh, well, now I've already lost Raynard. Where the hell is Raynard? Come back, is it Raynard or Raynard? I guess it's probably Raynard. And uh, he has this, uh, this blog called uh, Earth Food Life. Not sure how regular, I think it's just kind of an irregular, um, blog, but uh, I always enjoy checking in with R Reynard, and uh, today Reynard is offering us, I don't know the date on this, I'm assuming it's Richard Heinberg's uh, latest essay uh, from the Independent Media Institute, and I'm not going to sit here, if you don't know who Richard Heinberg is by now, Anyway, just trust me, Richard Heinberg is not a clueless moron. And so this essay, which is an excellent, is it primer or primer, on uh, why the renewable energy transition is failing. And now, I've had this rant probably uh, about 50 times uh, in, in the past year, and I was thinking of just uh, going on to the dead whale, but then it, I remember that some people are actually getting together with other human beings for Thanksgiving in three days, and just in case uh, you have a little <coughs> lefty in your family singing the praises of the renewable energy transition, this is just an excellent overview for uh, anyone, you know, just starting down the path to understand how uh, this pack of bright green lies we are being sold. Uh, it, it, it's the biggest bunch of bullshit. Uh, I'm not sure I have ever encountered a, a, a bigger pile of crap and a bigger pile of bright green lies than this crap about this renewable energy revolution. So just in case uh, you want to get into it uh, with some lefty uh, little greenie at, uh, at the dinner table on Thursday, this is an excellent place for you to start. So we're going to let Richard Heinberg give us the ABCs of the bright green lies. Take it away, Richard Heinberg. <clears throat> Renewable energy is not, is not replacing fossil fuel energy. It is adding to it. Despite all the renewable energy investments and installations, actual global greenhouse gas emissions keep increasing. That is largely due to economic growth. While renewable energy supplies have expanded in recent years, world energy usage, you know, renewables and fossil fuels, have ballooned even more. So, 
the entire pie has expanded. So even though one piece of the pie has expanded, uh, it's still not taking up any bigger piece of the pie. Uh, this, this is one of these great myths. I don't know if this is a lie or just a myth that renewable energy is taking up a bigger piece of a fixed size pie. The entire pie is expanding. So it makes no difference if this renewable energy piece of it is expanding or not. Okay, anyway, world energy usage has ballooned even more with the difference, you know, the main part of the pie being supplied by fossil fuels. The more the world economy grows, the harder it is for additions of renewable energy to turn the tide by actually replacing energy from fossil fuels rather than just adding to the energy from fossil fuels. <coughs> the notion, the very notion, I added the word very, the notion of voluntarily reining in economic growth in order to minimize climate change and make it easier to replace fossil fuels is political anathema, not just in the rich countries whose people have gotten used to consuming at extraordinarily high rates, but even more so in poorer countries, which have been promised the opportunity to develop. After all, it is the rich countries that have been responsible for the great majority of past emissions, which are driving climate change presently. Indeed, these countries got rich largely by the industrial activity of which carbon emissions were a byproduct. Now it is the world's poorest nations that are experiencing the brunt of the impacts of climate change caused by the world's richest. It's neither sustainable nor just to perpetuate the exploitation of land, resources, and labor in the less industrialized countries, as well as historically exploited communities in the rich countries to maintain both the lifestyles and expectations of further growth of the wealthy minority. Okay, I think we can, even those of us guilty of this, cannot argue with, with this logic. From the perspective of people in less industrialized nations, it is natural to want to consume more, which only seems fair. But that translates to more global growth and a harder time replacing fossil fuels with renewables globally. China is the exemplar of this conundrum. Over the past three decades, the world's most populous nation, well, for a, about another year, lifted hundreds of millions of its people out of poverty. But in the process, China became the world's biggest producer and consumer of coal, and not just coal. I, I would be interested to see uh, if you put the top 500 things to consume, uh, natural resources to consume. My guess is that China is the number one consumer of, out of 500, I am guessing 480.
That's just a wild guess. Maybe I'll suggest that to Richard Heinberg for a future uh, rant. So let's talk about the materials dilemma. <clears throat> also posing an enormous difficulty for a societal switch from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources is our increasing need for minerals and metals. The World Bank, the IEA, the IMF, and McKinsey and Company have all issued reports in the last couple of years warning of this growing problem. Vast quantities of minerals and metals will be required not just for making solar panels and wind turbines, but also for batteries, electric vehicles, and new industrial equipment that runs on electricity rather than carbon-based fuels. Some of these materials are already showing signs of increasing scarcity. According to the World Economic Forum, the average cost of producing copper has risen by over 300% in recent years, while copper ore grade has dropped by 30%. Optimistic assessments of the materials challenge suggest there are enough global reserves, you know, after enough mining the planet to save the planet, optimistic assessment suggests there are enough global reserves for a one-time build-out of all these new devices and infrastructure needed. Assuming some substitutions with, for example, lithium for batteries eventually being replaced by more abundant elements like iron. But what is society to do as that first generation of devices and infrastructure ages and requires replacement? Well, this will lead some of the techno-optimists into discussions of the circular economy. The circular economy, a mirage? Hence, the rather sudden and widespread interest in the creation of a circular economy in which everything is recycled endlessly. Unfortunately, as economist Nicholas Georgescu Rogen discovered in his pioneering work on entropy, recycling is always incomplete and always costs energy. Materials typically degrade during each cycle of use and some material is wasted in the recycling process itself. Yeah, like 95% of it. A French preliminary analysis of the energy transition that assumed maximum possible recycling found that a materials supply crisis could be delayed by up to three centuries. Oh yes. But will the circular economy, itself an enormous undertaking and a distant goal, arrive in time to buy industrial civilization, those extra 300 years, or will we run out of critical metals and ma critical materials in just the next few decades in our frantic effort to build as many renewable energy devices as we can in as short a time as possible. The latter outcome seems more likely if pessimistic resource estimates turn out to be accurate. Simon Michel of the Finnish Geological Survey finds that, quote, 
global reserves are not large enough to supply enough metals to build the renewable non-fossil fuel industrial system. Mineral deposit discovery has been declining for many metals. The grade of processed ore for many of the industrial metals has been decreasing over time, resulting in declining mineral processing yield. This has the implication of the increase in mining energy consumption per unit of metal, close quote. And I've talked about this, and Richard has links. You can find uh, a lot of Simon Michaux, M-I-C-H-A-U-X, I guess that's how you pronounce it, on YouTube, uh, who really breaks all this down. <clears throat> Steel prices are already trending higher, and lithium supplies may prove to be a bottleneck to rapidly increasing battery production. Even sand is getting scarce. Only certain grades of the stuff are useful in making concrete, which anchors wind turbines, or silicon, which is essential for solar panels. More sand is consumed yearly than any other material besides water, and some climate scientists have identified it as a key sustainability challenge this century. Predictably, as sand deposits are depleted, sand is becoming more of a geopolitical flashpoint with China recently embargoing sand shipments to Taiwan with the intention of crippling Taiwan's ability to manufacture semiconductor devices such as cell phones. Okay, what next? To reduce risk, reduce scale. During the fossil fuel era, the global economy depended on ever-increasing rates of extracting and burning coal, oil, and natural gas. The renewables era, if it indeed comes into being, will be founded upon the large-scale extraction of minerals and metals for solar panels, wind turbines, batteries, and other infrastructure, which will require, require periodic replacement. These two economic eras imply different risks. The fossil fuel regime risked depletion in pollution, notably atmospheric carbon pollution leading to climate change. The renewables regime will likewise risk depletion from mining minerals and metals and pollution from dumping old panels, turbines, and batteries and from various manufacturing processes, but with diminished vulnerability to climate change. The only way to lessen risk altogether would be to reduce substantially society's scale of energy and materials usage, but very few policymakers or climate advocacy organizations are exploring that possibility, and of course, not even Richard Heinberg is going to touch the third rail, the number one and easiest way to do that is to reduce the demand of all of this shit by reducing the number of humans being born on this planet making the demands. A person, I don't care whether they're 
uh, in the U.S. or Uganda, a person who is never born will use exactly zero of this planet's resources. Anyway, I just had to throw that in since I don't know if Richard Heinberg has ever discussed overpopulation in his own body of work. And then we have the, this little inconvenient fact that climate change hobbles efforts to combat climate change. As daunting as they are, the financial, political, and material challenge to the energy transition do not exhaust the list of potential barriers. Climate change itself is also hampering the energy transition, which, of course, is being undertaken to avert climate change. During the summer of 2022, that would be, I barely remember, the summer of 2022, China experienced its most intense heat wave in six decades. It impacted a wide region from central Sichuan province to coastal Jiangsu with temperatures often topping 40 degrees Celsius or 104 degrees Fahrenheit and reaching a record 113 degrees in Chongqing on August 18th. At the same time, a drought-induced power crisis forced contemporary Amperex technology company, the world's top battery maker, to close its manufacturing plants in China's Sichuan province. Supplies of crucial parts of, to Tesla and Toyota were temporarily cut off. Meanwhile, a similarly grim story unfolded in Germany as record drought reduced the water flow in the Rhine River to levels that crippled European trade, halting shipments of diesel and coal, and threatening the operation of both hydroelectric and nuclear power plants. You know, they're just talking about they just had to shut down a big hydropower plant in Spain this week. Took it completely offline because there's no water left and, and behind the dam to turn the, to turn the uh, turbines. A study published in February of this year in the journal Water found that droughts, which are becoming more frequent and severe with climate change, could create challenges uh, for U.S. hydropower in Montana, Nevada, Texas, Arizona, California, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. Meanwhile, French nuclear plants that rely on the Rhone River for cooling water have had to shut down repeatedly. If reactors expel water downstream that is too hot, aquatic life is wiped out as a result. So, during the sweltering 2022 summer, the France's electric utility powered down reactors not only along the Rhone, but also on a second major river in the south. Altogether, France's nuclear power output has been cut by nearly 50% during the summer of 2022. Heavy rain and flooding can also pose risks for both hydro and nuclear power, which together currently provide roughly four times as much low carbon electricity Globally as, globally as wind and solar combined. In March of 2019, severe flooding in southern and western Africa damaged two major hydro plants, cutting off power for several days. Wind turbines and solar panels also rely on the weather and are therefore also vulnerable to extremes. 
cold, cloudy days with virtually no wind, spell trouble for regions heavily reliant on renewable energy. Freak storms can damage solar panels and high temperatures reduce panels efficiency. Hurricanes and storm surges can cripple offshore wind farms. The transition from fossil fuels to renewables faces an uphill battle. Do you think so? Still, this switch is an essential stopgap strategy to keep electricity grids up and running, at least on a minimal scale, as civilization inevitably turns away from a depleting store of oil and gas. The world has become so dependent on grid power for communications, finance, and the preservation of technical, scientific, and cultural knowledge that if the grids were to go down permanently and soon, it is likely that billions of people would die, and the survivors would be cultural, culturally destitute. In essence, we need renewables for a controlled soft landing, but the harsh reality is that for now and in the foreseeable future, the energy transition is not going well and has poor overall prospects. We need a realistic plan for energy descent instead of foolish dreams of eternal consumer abundance by means other than fossil fuels. Currently, politically rooted insistence on continued economic growth is discouraging truth-telling and serious planning for how to live well with less. And if you are wondering who this is, Richard Heinberg is a senior fellow at the Post Carbon Institute and the author of Power, Limits and Prospects for Human Survival. And I'm quite sure any uh, any uh, conspiracy wacko uh, would, you know, claim that uh, Richard Heinberg is a pawn of the New World Order, particularly that Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum, you will have nothing and you will be happy. More, more people believe that. They honestly believe that uh, than believe one word that Richard Heinberg just said. There are more people on this planet believing that about uh, the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab uh, trying to kill us all. Anyway, uh, get out there and enjoy uh, Enjoy what while you still can. You just better enjoy everything you got while you still can. Because it ain't going to be long over. You're going to have nothing and you're going to be happy. You better learn to live with nothing and be happy. So get out there and enjoy grabbing everything you can get while you still can. Bye, guys.